Okay, Luke Acts for Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number 24, Paul's Arrest and Imprisonment, part two of this section, Acts 23.12 to 25.12. So this is the second part of a three-part lesson, um, three-part lesson set concerning the, uh, the varied and the lengthy uh, period of Paul's imprisonment. He was in prison in a lot of different places. Um, in part one, I described the, the situation and the events that led to his initial rescue and detainment. At the beginning, it was just a detainment by Roman soldiers uh, from an angry mob in the, in the temple. Actually, they rescued him from being killed by the, uh, by the mob. And then during this time, he tried to uh, address the crowd and later on was brought before uh, Jewish leaders in order to find a, a crime to charge him with. These attempts failed, as we learned, uh, as both the mob and the religious leaders fell into disarray to the point where the soldiers had to once again take him into custody in order to uh, protect him and to save, his, uh, to save his life. So in the section that we're going to cover today, Luke is going to continue to describe Paul's journey through the, uh, actually through the Roman legal system as he fulfills Jesus' prophecy uh, of uh, being able to proclaim the gospel to various governors and kings in the Roman Empire. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Jesus said, well, I'm, I'm setting you aside for a special ministry. You're going to preach to governors. You're going to preach to kings. And I don't know if it, if it was me and he, he said that to me, I'd be thinking, wow, I'm going to have a pretty, I'm going to have a pretty cool ministry. You know, I'm going to be preaching to governors and kings. Who knew it was going to be as a prisoner? <laughs> he didn't know that at the beginning. And there's a lesson in there somewhere. And so we pick it up here, the uh, conspiracy. The conspiracy beginning in Acts uh, uh, chapter 23. So let's uh, kind of read this section here. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who had formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case by a more thorough investigation. And we, for our part, are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. But the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, leave this young man to the commander for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to leave this young man to you since he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand and stepping aside began to inquire of him privately. What is that that you have to report to me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them for more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him who have bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they slay him. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man go instructing him tell no one that you have notified me of these, um, of these things. And so uh, as the uh, most uh, educated and highest uh, profile Jewish convert to Christianity, Paul, beca uh, Paul became the, uh, the, the, the number one target of the Jewish leadership for, uh, for destruction. And he was dangerous for several reasons. First of all, he could appeal to every class of Jewish society by virtue of the fact that uh, he once was a Pharisee and a respected teacher of the law. That's a, that was a very high profile position uh, you know, in Jewish culture at that time. He was also a good debater. He could successfully debate other teachers and priests concerning the scripture so he could uh, not be defeated. He couldn't be discredited just on simple debating. He knew the scriptures. He was well known. He was well known both in Jerusalem and throughout the empire by Jews. 
as well as Jew, uh, Gentile converts to Judaism, as well as uh, Jewish and Gentile converts to Christianity. So he attracted attention in ways that no one else could in the, um, you know, in the, in the Jewish world as well as in the, um, the Christian world. Um, of course, uh, his personal holiness was irreproachable and he was credited with performing healings and miracles. Uh, we know that he was a Roman citizen, therefore he had protection under Roman law and he was beyond the reach of the Sanhedrin's legal or political system. They couldn't touch him. I mean, if he was in Jerusalem, perhaps, but once he was outside of Jerusalem, they, they didn't have a, a lot of power over him. And he was accepted as an apostle in the Christian church and as such had influence with a growing number of believers both in Jerusalem that threatened the status quo which the Jewish leaders wanted to maintain at all costs. I mean, they killed Jesus. So nothing, you know, there would be nothing holding them back from killing Paul. And then he appealed to the Gentiles. And this was his worst sin as far as the Jews were concerned. He appealed to the Gentile, and that drove them to murderous rage. The fact that he was responsible for bringing Gentiles into the church and then encouraging both Gentile and Jewish converts to dwell and worship together as equals. That was his worst offense as far as the Jews were concerned. You know, he's the one Paul is the one that teaches there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Oh boy, <laughs> they didn't buy into that at all. They were very much invested in the idea that at the top were the priests, especially the Sanhedrin, and then the Pharisees, and then the scribes, and then the regular people, and then the sinners, and then the, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the lame and the crippled and you know, at the very bottom. And then underneath that, uh, you had perhaps the Gentile converts to Judaism. And then underneath all of that, you had the Gentiles. That was, that was their order. That was their universe. That's how their universe you know, looked like. And they wanted to maintain that status quo. Why? Because they were at the top. The ones at the top always want to maintain the status quo. <laughs> so, you know, nothing new. So Paul threatened this whole you know, notion, their whole world, uh, by his preaching and his presence. So in doing this, Paul was violating their sense of privilege and destiny as God's people and threatening to destroy the purity of their religion, which as practiced by these leaders, consisted of maintaining a cultural exclusivity, which they mistook for piety. Imagine. The fact that they had nothing to do with the unwashed masses, the fact they had nothing to do with the poor and the ignorant, they saw that as being holy. I'm being a holy person. I don't even touch these people. They thought that keeping Gentiles out was the way to remain pure and please God, when in fact the job was to bring the Gentiles in from paganism to worship the true and living God. But of course, keep Gentile and pagan practices and worship out as a way of maintaining their purity. So yes, you know, it's the old story, love the sinner, hate the sin. They just hated the sinner and the sins. In other words, Love and receive the sinner, the Gentile, hate the sin, pagan morals and, and religious practices. As I said, they simply hated the Gentile and marginalized the Gentile converts to Judaism, thus creating a class system within the Jewish religious uh, system, where, as I said, the priests and the Pharisees were at the top and the people, the poor, the lame, the sinners, the tax collectors, they made up the lower classes and then the Gentile converts were at the bottom rung. So Paul was their sworn enemy because he preached that all of these people occupied the same position in the eyes of God through Christ, basically. They didn't like that. There was no special spot for them in Christianity. 
So knowing these things helps us understand the zeal that they had in plotting to kill him. You know, if you're wondering, what was their deal? They're always trying, that was their deal. So we note again that Luke provides personal information about Paul's nephew, warning him about the murder plot. This is a very rare glimpse into Paul's private family life that only a close acquaintance like Luke could provide. I mean, you know, we read about, you know, we read the Bible and, and you know, it's, it's lofty and the ideas are high and, and noble, and of course they are. Then you figure out, oh, Paul's sister. <laughs> he had a sister. He had a nephew. You know, he was an ordinary person with an ordinary family who was living in extraordinary times and called by God to do extraordinary things, but he was still a down-to-earth person with a family. So we keep reading verse, um, in, chapter, in uh, Acts 23, uh, verse 23, it says, And he called to him two of the centurions and said, Get two hundred soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea with seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen. They were also to provide mounts for, uh, to put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote a letter having this form. Claudius uh, Lysias to the most excellent governor, uh, governor Felix, greetings. When this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And wanting to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council, and I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. But the next day, leaving the horsemen to go on with him, they returned to the barracks. When these had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. When he had read it, he asked from what province he was. And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive also, giving orders for him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. So Luke names the commander, Claudius Lysias, another historical and social marker. And he provides the report to Felix. Felix was the procurator of Judea. A procurator was a, a tax, actually, a tax officer. That was his job. He was a tax officer, making sure that the taxes were properly uh, collected. Um, he summarizes the case. And notice in his letter to, the, to Felix, he summarizes the case, but he leaves out his own blunder in illegally arresting and attempting to torture a Roman citizen. That part he doesn't mention. <laughs> we read about that before, you know, that he was about to torture him. And Paul said, are, are you ready to torture a, a man who's a Roman citizen without a trial? And, and we read previously, last time, you know, that the uh, that uh, Claudius Lysia backed up and said, oh, you're a Roman citizen, oh, just a minute now, you know, and they, they didn't go ahead and do it. But notice in his letter, he doesn't mention that part, just the little thing there. He informs Felix that he has no legal charge to make against Paul, but because of the violence of the Jews, he's sending Paul and his accusers to Felix for him to kind of sort it all out, okay? So, uh, as for, if you were living then, and if you were on the Roman side of things, you know, watching this, this is a question of jurisdiction, is what it is. It's a question of jurisdiction, okay? Um, uh, Felix agrees to, uh, you know, to judge the preliminary hearing to determine if a charge can be made but since Paul is from another Roman province, the province of Cilicia, if you, you see that at the top there of the map, then he would send him there for the actual trial. Because he, he couldn't try him there. He had, to, he had to be tried in the province where he came from. And that's why he asked him, where do you come from? He said, oh, I come from you know, Tarsus. Oh, Tarsus, that's in, that's in the province of Cilicia. That's another governor up there. He's the one that's going to do this. But before I send him, Felix is thinking, let's see if we can have a hearing and figure out what charge to bring against Paul, okay? So in chapter 24, 
In chapter 24, uh, we, uh, we begin reading about Felix and uh, what Paul says uh, before him. A little bit about Felix here. Felix obtained his position through his brother Pallas, who was secretary of the treasury during the reign of the emperor Claudius. Interesting, both he, you know, Felix and his brother were actually slaves who became freedmen and eventually rose to power in the Roman government. Felix was uh, immoral, cruel, subject to bribes, which led to an increase in crime and instability in the Ju uh, Judea. Uh, Tacitus, the Roman historian, said of Felix that he had the position of a king, but the heart of a slave. Interesting summary of that particular man. Uh, we know that Felix ruled from 52 to 58 AD. So that gives us a historical fix as to when Paul came before him and when these things took place. Um, uh, he lived, Felix that is, lived in Herod's palace, which was uh, located in Caesarea, which was the official residence of the governor or the prefect or the proconsul or the king or the, they had all kinds of titles. It, it all meant the same thing. They had to collect the taxes, keep the peace. Okay? Um, and so whoever had that position lived in Herod's a palace in Caesarea. Paul was also kept there, although not in prison, while he waited for the formulation of some charge against him. So he was held there, today we would say he was under house arrest. So he couldn't leave, but he wasn't held in the, in the dungeon. Uh, Acts 24, uh, verses one to nine. So here the Jewish uh, leaders arrive and through their uh, chosen attorney or prosecutor, they make three charges against Paul. First, that he caused dissension among the Jews. Uh, secondly, um, uh, he led a renegade sect referred to here as the Nazarenes. You know, we, today we have you know, their churches, they're called the Church of the Nazarene. Well, they get this from this particular passage here. We, we haven't read it, I'm simply summarizing it for you. And it's the only time that that term is used to describe Christians in the, uh, in the New Testament. And another um, accusation, he was trying to uh, desecrate the temple. So those were the three accusations. Dissension, he was a rebel, you know, anarchist, and he had desecrated the temple of the Jews. Of course, there's a germ of truth in these accusations which give them a certain amount of credibility. Uh, there was dissension among the Jews, but they were the ones who caused it as they followed and persecuted Paul from city to city. They were the ones causing the trouble, not him. Uh, he was a leader in the church, one of many, but their goal was not rebellion against the government. Christian church was never fomented rebellion against the government. Paul even teaches in the book of Romans that we should obey the laws and we should obey the government and we should give honor to the king and, and so on and so forth. Um, and also he was present at the temple, but he was respecting its laws and its customs. He wasn't desecrating it. So the lawyer for the Jewish, uh, you know, the Jewish leader, religious leaders, uh, also lies concerning the Jews' actions, saying that they had arrested Paul and were bringing him to court for judgment, when in truth they had formed a mob and they tried to kill him, and, and, and the Roman soldiers are the ones that, that saved him. Luke also adds that the Jewish leaders attacked Paul once the uh, lawyer was finished. So once the lawyer presented the official case, then the Jewish priests and leaders you know, stepped up and, and also made other types of uh, character assassinations um, against uh, Paul. So uh, Luke adds, uh, so uh, uh, after this, um, it's time for Paul to speak. And you'll note his brief and respectful acknowledgement of Felix as he responds to these accusations. So we pick up the story in Acts 24, verse 10. It says, when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul responded. 
Knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense, since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Neither in the temple, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot, nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me. Um, Paul not only denies the charge, but challenges his accusers to actually provide proof. Wonderful thing about the Roman legal system, you had to provide proof in order to condemn someone. So that's what, uh, that's what, Paul, is, uh, that's what Paul is saying here. Uh, let's keep reading. But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written um, within, the, uh, within the prophets. Uh, having a hope in God which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. So his accusers were suggesting that Christianity was some form of religious or political fanaticism that threatened the stability of the people, even worse, that challenged Roman rule. That was their charge. Had not Jesus, their leader from Nazareth, been executed by a former governor for similar crimes? You know, that, that was their idea. Paul argues that his faith is no challenge to secular rule, having its source and promise in the very religion espoused by his accusers, and a message of punishment and reward at judgment which was quite familiar to everyone who was present. In other words, I'm not teaching anything that's causing any rebellion here. As a matter of fact, I'm teaching that the things that these people over here believe have been confirmed and fulfilled by you know, Jesus, the one I serve. Paul even uses the idea of God's judgment to defend himself against the charges that were against him, saying that as a faithful Christian, he would not do such things, meaning I would not cause trouble, I would not attack the government. As a sincere Christian, I wouldn't do that because that's sinful. We're not supposed to do that. So he wouldn't act this way. As a matter of conscience, it would be sinful if he did. Keep reading, verse 17. It says, now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation if they should have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council, other than for this one statement, which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. So Paul explains the reason why he was in the temple area in the first place, and there according to the law and according to custom. He brings up the cause for the riot, which ultimately led to his arrest and appearance before Festus. The false accusations of the Jews from Persia, from, Persia, from Asia. And who are the, the, the accusers from Asia? Well, Ephesus is in Asia. The Jews that made trouble in Ephesus for him. Well, they've come to Jerusalem and they're making trouble for him now in this place in the temple, accusing him of having brought a Gentile into the restricted area. It's the troublemakers from Asia, from Ephesus that are doing this. And he said, they should be here accusing me. And of course the implication is, and I would question them. It'd be my turn to question them. And what have they been doing in Ephesus and all the other places where they've been following me from church to church to cause trouble? That's, that's the point here. So Paul wraps up his defense by challenging his accusers to explain why they rioted when he proclaimed the basic promise of the gospel, and that is resurrection from the dead. Apparently the lawyer and the Jewish leaders had no counter arguments, no evidence, no comments with which they could respond to Paul. So we read up. It says, but Felix, having more exact knowledge about the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will decide your case. 
Then he gave orders to the centurion for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. So Felix, he, he understood Paul's arguments because he was familiar with Christianity's teaching. Interesting in this section here, they, they refer to Christianity as the Nazarenes and here the way, two familiar terms that were used in those days to describe Christianity. Long before in Antioch they began to refer, or excuse me, yes, before, uh, before the time in Antioch where uh, uh, at that particular uh, congregation they began to refer to themselves as Christians. So uh, Felix understands the situation. There's no evidence presented and Paul had a convincing and logical answer to the accusations. Since Felix had the advantage of being familiar with Christianity, he was able to establish Paul's credibility and honesty without further witnesses. He understood what Paul was saying. But this was about politics, you see. This wasn't about religion. He didn't have to make a judgment call about the faith or, or Paul's you know, uh, 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 way of expressing his religious beliefs. That was not about, this was about politics and power, not religion. So using the excuse that he needed to consult with Lysias, the commander, Felix, like a good politician, puts off a decision and he sends the Jewish leaders home and he keeps Paul under guard in the palace with a measure of movement to be able to receive visitors. That's what I mean about house arrest. And we get a glimpse of Felix's true motivation, however, in the following verses. So he's a shrewd politician. He doesn't want to cause trouble you know, because his, his superiors, all they want from him, maintain the peace, collect the taxes. We don't care how you do it. Maintain the peace, collect the taxes. That's all we want you to do. And if you do a good job, then you're going to move up. Maybe we'll call you away from this <laughs> far away place, as far as you can get away from the Roman, you know, from the center of power. If you're in Judea, if you're a, if you're a Roman official in Judea, you're not in, <laughs> you're not in the, exactly the power center. <laughs> You're in the middle of nowhere. So if you can do a good job there, you might get a, you know, a posting a little closer to the, you know, the center of power. So keep the peace, collect the taxes. So he doesn't want to get these Jewish leaders you know, upset, writing, writing letters to his superior. But on the other hand, Paul's a Roman citizen. He can't violate Paul's you know, rights as a, as a Roman citizen. And Paul is not, is, is not just some nobody, he, he's a well-known person in, uh, in Judaism as well as Christianity throughout the empire. So this is a delicate thing. So as I say, what does he do? He punts, you know, he, well, maybe we'll, uh, yeah, let me think about this, okay? So we read and continue reading verse 24. It says, but some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewish, a Jewess, excuse me, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. At the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So he seems to have been a, a conflicted man, this Felix. On the one hand, he's eager to hear Paul preach and teach and affected by the message. The fact that he feared suggests that he had a measure of faith because the word was getting to him. I mean, if you could preach the gospel to him and nothing, no reaction, no emotional or intellectual reaction, okay, you know, that's the hard ground right there. The seed is just bouncing off of it. But no, he felt guilty, he felt challenged. So that means that the message was kind of, you know, it was getting to him. On the other hand, he gave in to his greed by hoping to profit from Paul's imprisonment. And he demonstrated his lack of honor and mercy by keeping a man that he knew to be innocent unjustly imprisoned in order to gain favor with other evil men, all because of 
politics, all because of power. So Luke ends this section with another historical notation that this took place the year that another Roman official, Portius Festus, was replacing Felix as procurator. This we know happened in 59 or 60 AD. So uh, this leads us to uh, chapter 25. Not going to read uh, all of that for now. We do know something about um, Festus. History records that Portius Festus was fair, a reasonable person, much more so than Felix, the official he came to uh, replace. Luke records that three days after his arrival in Judea, Festus travels to Jerusalem in order to meet with the Jewish leaders. A normal thing. Again, he's the tax collector. He's the man to maintain the peace, so he's going to go see the, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. Their first, this is two years later now, their first order of business is a request to bring Paul back to Jerusalem for a trial that Festus can judge in Jerusalem. Of course, their goal is to kill Paul during the trip from Caesarea since they cannot win their case against him in court, nor can they attack you know, Herod's, Herod's palace. I mean, there was, that was, there was a garrison there. There were soldiers there, so they, they weren't going to you know, they weren't going to attack the, the garrison. So it had to be a stealth mission. It had to be an assassination. Okay. So Festus agrees to hear arguments for a trial in Jerusalem and he invites the leaders to come to Caesarea to make their case uh, for a change in venue. So let's pick it up. 25, it says, after he had spent not more than eight or 10 days among them, he went down to Caesarea and on the next day he took his seat on the tri uh, tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. After Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. While Paul said in his own defense, I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then when Festus had conferred with his counsel, he answered, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Now Luke doesn't describe the charges, you know, doesn't you know, rehash the whole trial over again. He, um, he notes that the Jewish accusers still have no proof. Of course, their goal is not to win the case, but to separate Paul from his guards in Herod's palace. That's the end game. Just let us get, just create a situation where we can get at this guy. Now in an effort to curry favor with the Jewish leadership, the new governor proposes a change in location to Jerusalem for the trial, obviously not aware of the true intentions of these men. Now, as a Roman citizen, Paul's case could not be moved to another jurisdiction other than Cilicia, where he came from, um, or the governor's palace where he was held without his permission. You see why that was important? As a Roman citizen, he had to be tried either where he was in the governor's you know, headquarters or in his own province at that governor's headquarters. He could, not be, he could not be moved without his own permission to another venue in order to be trialed, tried. Excuse me. You know, that, that, that was Roman law and Paul understood it and he took advantage of it. So seeing that he could not receive proper justice before this judge, you know, Festus, or the previous one, Felix, because these Roman officials wanted to avoid trouble with the local Jewish leaders, he used his privilege as a Roman citizen to be judged in Caesar's court in Rome by the emperor himself. Now in the Roman system, any citizen had the right to make an appeal to Caesar himself if he felt he was not receiving justice in the lower courts. A very interesting idea here. And believe it or not, in many cases, the emperor would actually hear the case himself 
or it would be heard in the imperial court at Rome, over which he had jurisdiction. So by making this request, uh, Festus is legally bound to transfer Paul to Rome where he will receive a fair hearing and also it removes him from the violent, uh, the violent threat of the Jews. Let's face it, uh, he, he, he's, in, he's in prison, he's, uh, he's waiting for Felix to make up his mind about him. Two years goes by. The only thing that happens is that he, you know, Felix tries to get a bribe out of him. And then Festus comes and he figures, okay, here's my chance. And Festus, thinking to be very fair, wanting to resolve the issue, gives into the idea of maybe bringing him back to Jerusalem, having him tried there, you know, that'll satisfy the Jewish leaders, you know, and Paul could be acquitted there, and then this matter is all finished. And so Paul understands the game. He knows what's going on. He knows he'll, he'll rot in jail. He'll rot in Festus jail. When the next guy comes along, he'll, he'll still be in jail. So he makes his move, and his move is to be tried in Caesar's court, checkmate for the Jewish leaders. He's freed from the local politics of the, you know, the game that's being played here, and he's taken his chances by being tried in uh, Caesar's court. And we will pick it up there next week. Uh, the uh, assignment, as you know, uh, just to read ahead, because I don't read everything in class, Acts 25, 13 to 26, 32. We're heading towards the end. Two more lessons left and we will have completed Luke and Acts together in an entire series. Okay, thank you for your attention.